Well, good afternoon. Uh, welcome to the Dan and Kale Barak President's Distinguished Lecture Series. Um, I'm Tony D'Amato. I'm the director of the UVM Forestry Program. I'm really pleased to have an opportunity here to host uh, Chris Caldwell. I also want to acknowledge uh, Dr. Lubin Dimoff, who's done a lot of the work in coordinating Chris's visit to come here, as well as Dr. Sherry Morris from the Geography Department that's also played an important supporting role in getting our speaker here today. Um, I feel really privileged to be able to have Chris here speaking. Um, he's the director of the Sustainable Development Institute with the College of Menominee Nation in Kashina, Wisconsin. Um, those familiar with Chris's work is a real leader as it relates to understanding questions around tribal resilience as it relates to both changing climate conditions, changing disturbance regimes, as well as just changing cultural values. Um, Chris is a real leader in both understanding tribal pers perspectives as it relates to the natural world, as well as managed landscapes, but also in connecting scientists with tribes to better understand how we grapple with some of these questions going forward around climate change and what does that mean from both a cultural and ecological perspective. Um, I've been fortunate to get to know Chris over the past seven years. He's the PI for the College of Menominee as part of the Northeast Climate Adaptation Science Center, where again, he's led many efforts connecting scientists both around climate science as well as for resource management with tribal perspectives to really get a better, deeper understanding of what sustainability means um, going forward. So I'm really happy today to have Chris here on campus and want to welcome him as part of our lecture series. So Chris, come on up. Uh, test, can you hear me? Okay, good. Well, first of all, I just wanted to start by uh, acknowledging the lands of the Abenaki people, the um, ancestral territory. I was, I was happy that one of the things I could do today before the, the lecture was attend a workshop where we had a, um, an official welcome by one of the, the tribal leaders for the Abenaki. Um, I forget his name, Charlie, um, Charlie, uh, but he, he gave a, a proper introduction. And so I just wanted to, to recognize the lands that were on the ancestral territory. And um, I, I say that because as I came here, I also recognize ancestral lands when I, whenever I um, go somewhere because it, it's as simple as just seeing what would be a good place to live? What has the elements necessary to, to sustain life? And definitely it's a beautiful area, a beautiful campus. So just wanted to say that. And also to acknowledge um, Tony, Tony's efforts and uh, Lubin's efforts in arranging to get me here. Um, so I'm, I'm busy a lot with the, the work that I do at the Institute. The other part that make, made it tough was that I just started a doctoral program um, back at Madison. So I'm both a researcher or a PI on a project and my own graduate student. And it gets a little tough to keep them sorted out. But um, I wanted to, uh, to just, uh, oh, and, and to thank the, the Barack Lecture Series for this opportunity. So um, I wanted to just talk about some of the work that I do. And the title itself is actually a representation of both the work that I do as director and also my current efforts to start to think about a dissertation project that is really a reflection on this work I've done for the past seven years at the college, but also spans back into my other um, work as uh, tribal resource and compliance officer, um, my work as a forestry technician and on different conservation crews um, back when I was in the field and, and all of that, pulling it all together into this, um, this presentation and discussion. <clears throat> oh. There we go. Uh, so when I said I'd I can recognize ancestral lands, and it's as simple as just seeing the elements that sustain life. I, I draw that reference from uh, looking at the homelands that I come from, uh, and we call ourselves the Menominee, our name for ourselves is Mamachitawak. So Mamachitawak Akihi is uh, Menominee land. Um, this is kind of a odd, maybe if I can hang out here. Um, so it, it's, uh, this is on the poster, um, but one of the things that I talk about when, when I use this slide, this photo, is 
just noting the, both the, um, the human and the natural impacts on the landscape. So thinking in terms of um, the remnants of the impacts from the glaciers, um, the glacial till, the retreating of the glaciers and what it left on the landscape, but also the, the continued natural impacts. Here's a, um, a line, a tornado line from 2009 where it, uh, it started on the western end of our reservation. It touched down, hopped up, touched down again, and just start cutting through the forest like a buzzsaw, basically. And you can see it went all the way, extended all the way up into the national forest. And so within that, con um, that context there, the natural context, we also have on the landscape this, this difference between um, value systems or the way that land, the land is approached in terms of relationships. So you can see the Menominee Reservation just because of the contrast between the forested land of our, our reservation and the um, cutover areas in the farmlands that surround it that are a remnant from the 1800s when, when the forest was cut over and converted to farmland. And so I, I usually start with that, just talking about those two, two um, impacts on the landscape. But more importantly, I talk a little more um, on the human values that impact the landscape. And that's really just a, one representation of the work we do at the Sustainable Development Institute and one component of the, the model that has been developed at the Institute that we use to, to both um, conduct our work and uh, tell us how we approach the work that we're doing. And so this is, this is a, a one slide summary of both the history of the Institute, its development, but also um, a reflection on the history of our people, of the Menominee people, and specifically our story of sustainable forestry. Um, the Menominee theoretical model of sustainability was developed by tribal leaders back in the 90s, around the time that um, the College of Menominee Nation was also created. And it was a way to, to better understand our relationships but also in that, um, at that time period, the United Nations was talking about sustainable development and um, was there actually such a thing or was the term, or was the term an oxymoron? Did it even make sense? And at the time, tribal leaders felt that our story of sustainable forestry could be an example of sustainable development. And so, as they talked about this concept, this idea, and how it might apply in the Menominee context, one of the things that, that came, to, um, came to the front was that the, the usual sustainability models, the ecological, economic, social, or the three-legged stool, it didn't apply to the Menominee story. And so as our tribal leaders talked about it, they started to identify specific areas or dimensions that were important to the story and that they highlighted. Um, the land and sovereignty component was definitely an important one for Menominee and uh, more generally for tribes. Um, natural environment, economics, institutions, um, technology, human perception, activity, and behavior. So these areas of community life or these dimensions uh, were a part of that, that description, and at the center was the concept of autochthony. Um, when, I, when I started back to school, when I attended College of Menominee Nation, um, after working in forestry, I was introduced to the model and the, the word autochthony, so if um, Fred were to mention Menominee or talk in Menominee language, in my mind, autochthony at the time, it sounded like a Menominee word. And so I think I went for a few weeks before I understood it wasn't a Menominee word and I looked it up in the dictionary. And really what it is meant to signify is um, nativeness of the land itself and just signifies that place-based connection that the Menominee have with the landscape. Uh, we still reside on our ancestral land base, although it's um, largely reduced. 
But that's kind of the anchoring point for the model, making it a place-based model. Um, the other part is that as we look at the model and we think about sustainable development and working towards sustainable goals, it's not necessarily that we're working to achieve a, a balance, a perfect balance, or that we say that there's any sort of um, point where we will re achieve sustainable development, but it's actually the process of uh, maintaining the balance, working towards the balance and reconciling tensions within and between all of those dimensions. So we kind of say as a, a premise for the model, as we're looking at human environmental relationships and impacts on those relationships, if there's a decision made in one of the dimensions, it re ripples throughout and across all of the dimensions and changes the context that we're investigating that, that issue. And so in that way, we've already started to change the context and advance the model and the story in whatever um, issue we're investigating. And so it becomes this iterative process of um, not only identifying issues, but also using the model to um, think through and organize our thinking around the complexity of the issue to develop a solution. And in this regard, it it's, um, creates this iterative or intergenerational process where it's a, a continual effort to address the tensions that are identified. Um, we do have a, um, some of my colleagues and I, Mike Dockery was the primary author he was the Forest Service liaison at the time and worked a lot with the Institute in the relationship there. Um, <clears throat> but we got together and we wrote a, an article that described this process a little more um, specifically the history and the application in, in both our, in research, education, and outreach. So if you're interested, um, you could Google the Institute or I can get the link out to to get it sent out. Um, <clears throat> but some of the, um, the description of the model, some of the, the, um, the basic understandings or the, the history that's associated with the model, um, it, it really comes in the form of our connection with the land, so people and land. And as I mentioned, for Menominee, the land and sovereignty dimension is, is very important just in the context of connection to that land base. Um, on this left side here, this map shows the ancestral territory of the Menominee prior to European colonization, prior to American settler expansion. And, and what, it, what it demonstrates is, is the connection across the landscape, but also it shows the range that um, that we, we lived on this landscape. And so the name, when I said Mamachitawik, that means uh, ancient ones or the ancient movers. And that signifies that uh, as a people, it was more of a seasonal round of living. So unlike out here in the East where it seems like it's all suburban or city area, um, based on my experience, mm -hmm. it feels like I drive through endless suburbs when I'm out here. Um, it wasn't like the Menominee um, all, occupied all of this territory at once. It was um, different bands who moved in, in seasonal rotations based on when food was available, based on when material medicines were available. And so um, the impact on the landscape was not, was not permanent once the uh, area was um, harvested from or, or used for um, sustenance, subsistence, um, the band moved to the next area. But that, that did change when uh, once the, the federal, the U.S. government came into being. And once they came into Wisconsin, the, um, through settlement and government interactions, treaties were the, the common way of relationships. The federal government made treaties with tribes and the Menominee were no exception. And so we can see here um, the, the different colors, the different uh, hatchings on, the, on these sections here signify the different treaties um, that were entered into 
between the federal government and the Menominee until the last one was entered into in 1856, which created our present day reservation. So you can see the change from 10 mil, about 10 million acres of ancestral territory to 235,000 acres in a little, a little less than 40 years. <clears throat> and so it, it created this land base, which um, Menominee is the 72nd county in Wisconsin. Um, and what this signified really was was a change or a transition in the way that um, Menominee lived, the way that Menominee connected with the landscape. And uh, I, I think about those changes in a, a few different ways, but one of the, the ways I think about it these days is just thinking in terms of language, both our language and also the language of uh, folks that were coming into the area. Um, as I said, Mamachitawak was the name we are, is the name we have for ourselves. Um, the Ojibwe people coming in, they, they noted our connection to wild rice. Um, so Manumin um, or Manumini, the wild rice people, even the French during the trade era, uh, fur trade era, noted that connection in the term foal of Juan. I think that's how you say it in French. My French is really bad. It's non-existent other than reading that title. But, um, but they also noted that relationship, the wild oatmen. And eventually, um, thinking of the way we talk, our, the name wild rice people came out as Menominee. So that's the English version of it um, and signifies that transition. And then a little further along, Omatnomene, which is the way we say uh, people of the wild rice in the Menominee language. But one of the things that I, I find interesting as I, as I do the work that I do and um, the mission of the Institute of reflecting on this history and these relationships is that more people know us for, for Metakua Kiku Kanawatakua the forest keepers, so our forest management practices, then they know us as the people of the wild rice. Uh, locally, I think people still realize that, but there's a change in that and there's a, a diminished um, connection there or relationship. And that's interesting in itself as we think about um, resilience, but also the introduction of climate change and what that means in terms of impacting our communities and, and the way that we connect. <clears throat> so, so as I talked about access to the ancestral lands to the, um, the final treaty that was entered into in the 1850s, one of the ways that, that we transitioned as a people still maintained that effort to continue our relationship with the forest. Um, the federal government, their solution to working with, or working with, their solution to addressing the, the Indian issue was to make everybody a farmer, to break up the land, landscape, assign plots, and then have everybody farm individually. And that wasn't the way that the tribes operated, or at least how many, didn't, we didn't operate that way. Um, so. The question was, how are we going to maintain our relationship with the landscape on a, a reduced land base with um, less access to that seasonal way of living? And so <clears throat> um, I always hear stories in the community, people talk about, well, the government wanted to uh, make us farmers. We did become farmers, we became tree farmers. So. I don't know. I don't know if that's actually what our tribal leaders said at the time. That's probably just the more contemporary description of it. But one thing that our tribal leader, Chief Oshkosh, did say after consulting with tribal members on how we might go about maintaining our relationship, but also um, harvesting timber from the forest, which was re introduced at that time, and not just the dead, dead trees that we were um, relegated to at that time, but how might we um, 
pull green timber from the forest. And so his, this concept, this philosophy of starting in, from the rising sun and cutting to the setting sun and taking only the, the mature trees, the sick trees, and the trees that have fallen was more uh, based off of thinking of the values of taking only what the forest was willing to give or to provide. And that's a value that connected um, long before and something that Menominee understood where Chief Oshkosh was the speaker, he was not necessarily the only one thinking this way. It, it was after talking to the, the community, um, gathering information that this is the um, statement that was attributed to him. And so by doing the cutting in this manner, uh, he said the trees would last forever. And that's, uh, that's a value that, um, <clears throat> that talks about both understanding the generational needs of present and future, but also understanding our connection to the, the non-human beings that are part of the landscape, not just the human beings that are part but the non-human in our relationship with those, those non-human beings, our responsibility to them, and um, this reciprocal, uh, what does the forest provide to us? What do we do for the forest type of relationship? So just to kind of give you a quick idea of relationships. Um, so this is where our, our reservation lands are now. And if you look at this map, of ecological classifications that the Wisconsin DNR puts out. Right through the middle of the reservation, there's a, a tension zone, they call it. It's a, it changes from a, a sandier type of area, so a barrens, pine, barrens, oak, savanna type area to um, richer habitat, um, richer soils, so more of a northern hardwoods, hemlock, um, forest cover type. And so this, this is important just in terms of um, thinking about relationships because what it shows is that these forest communities, so even though we've been uh, limited to a smaller land base, there's actually a lot of diversity within this limited land base in terms of forest community covered, uh, forest habitat types. So these are plant associations, um, habitat types that show the different plants that grow together. And you can see that uh, the, the change in the makeup of the plant systems changes from this sandier site to these richer areas here. There's actually a the transition or tension zone right through the, the middle. And it's important to understand those plant relationships, not just in terms of if um, community members were still gathering medicine, still gathering plants for food, but in contemporary terms, thinking in terms of um, managing according to what that site would best provide in terms of tree species for quality saw timber. Um, and this reflects the forest cover types, the different tree relationships, which if you, look, if you ever look at a stand and you see trees there, a composition or a single species, it's not always the best indicator for what tree species would best grow on that site. Um, the plant communities are actually more reflective of the type of soils that are there, which would then reflect what type of tree species might grow best on that site. So there's important connections, important relationships in terms of thinking through that. So as I kind of flick through those uh, last three slides, one of the things when I come to this one is uh, talk about I don't know how many people are familiar with hearing the integrating indigenous knowledge in uh, Western-based science or contemporary science. Um, I view this as an example of that integration because the, the statement or the, the philosophy that Chief Oshkosh had shared in terms of 
starting at the setting sun and cutting to the or rising sun and cutting to the setting sun is not literally how we manage our forests. It's actually evolved in terms of uh, breaking it into more manageable pieces. So um, right here, and these are just designations just to uh, make it more manageable in terms of inventory classification and setting up harvest schedules, but um, it turns it into block one, which is uh, the reservation boundary in the Wolf River and block two, which is the Wolf River in the old railroad grade and block three, which is the railroad grade to the western border. And within each of those blocks are compartments which are further broken down according to road systems, rivers, um, other geophysical features, natural and uh, man-made. And within each of these compartments are stand, stand level, um, stand level um, breakdowns where it then becomes um, a representation of what forest cover types, what um, plant compositions are in those areas. And so by identifying the, the forest cover type, the foresters can then manage according to the different needs of each of these smaller sites. So uh, northern hardwoods have a different cycle than pure oak stands, than uh, white pine stands, than um, jack pine uh, dry, on drier sites. They have different needs, different life cycles. And this helps break it down into a management approach that is based off of what is best for the health of the forest. And so it's, this is all based off of that philosophy statement. That was the, the guidance or the, the implementing framework for that. And I think one of the things that <clears throat> This was, I think, satellite photos became a, a thing back in the 80s, the late 80s. I'm not, I remember seeing the first black and white photo because it, it was a big thing because NASA said the reservation was so distinct that they used the corners of the reservation to um, orient their satellites because it was a distinct feature on the, the landscape. And it, it became important because it, it really uh, brought to light the, the values. You could see the values on the landscape. You could see this, um, this difference between values in terms of the, the Menominee, as we, our leaders sought to preserve our relationship with the lands that, that were available, and the change of the the cutovers of the 1800s and then turning it into farmlands. Um, so it, it really introduced this new way of thinking and looking at the impact that our, our management techniques might have on that landscape, both for us internally in thinking in the community, but also externally. Um, <clears throat> so one of, one of the things, and this is kind of the work that I'm doing both at the Institute, but also as I um, start my program, is thinking about those differences in values where, where I grew up and there was always a contention, contention within the communities about these practices, these management practices. And yet, anytime I went out and talked to people on the outside or not from the community, it seemed like there was universal praise for this, those same practices. So there was this contrast in, um, in perspective on these practices. And that's really what has pushed me to go from working in the field, um, marking the timber to be cut for harvest, and to working um, in the administrative and planning level to the research level now in thinking about these questions. So, the impact of values on the landscape is a, is a big part of um, the work that I do, the research that I'm hoping to do in my, my doctoral program. But just to kind of talk a little about um, 
um, transitioning from that history, which forms the basis of our institute and give you a little context of how we're set up. Um, College of Menominee Nation was chartered by the Menominee people in the 90s, 93. Um, and that was out of our, we have our own tribal constitution. And so um, the, the college is a chartered entity of, of the tribe. And so we focus on tribal needs like the other 38 tribal colleges and universities in the nation, um, business, public admin, education, natural resources. Um, we are a land grant institution. So I, I think you said Vermont, our university is the land grant. Um, in that context, there were 1994s, which are the tribal colleges, and we are land grants. Um, for CMN, our our enrollment has kind of leveled out. It had been up around 600, but it followed the same trend as uh, nationwide enrollment in college was declining. But we're starting to level out and um, we offer associate degrees primarily, but we've been building up uh, bachelor level degrees, uh, certificates, and a couple new things that are important here just in terms of the connecting the institute to the colleges that we've been working with our faculty um, on developing an integrative studies and sustainability bachelor degree based on the model that I talked about. And so this will be um, <clears throat> interdisciplinary, of course, and, and work through um, not just thinking about sustainability in terms of natural resources, which is what a lot of people connect it with, but really expanding it across all of those community areas, business, public admin, um, engineering, education. And so that, that's a progress in work. We're hoping to out, um, put that out by next fall. The other thing is we just recently hired a faculty member to develop a sustainable ag degree program um, and looking at how do we base it off of our, our indigenous values? How do we look at the different food systems, not just what people associate with um, farming, which is uh, row crops and cows. And that's probably the biggest thing in terms of our community, trying to dispel that stereotype, I guess, when we talk about sustainable agriculture. Um, but as I said, uh, the college, was created in the 90s. The Institute is a, a project of the college, the tribal leaders at the time, reflecting on that sustainable forestry story, but also after reflecting, the mission of the, the Institute was to then um, find ways to extend that into other areas of community life. And there's a second part to our mission, which is then sharing what we're learning through the, through the work that we do. Uh, the different projects. And so um, we're working with one of our, our CMN students now, and I think she's started framing it in a, a way that really brings to light these two models that we work with is um, how we do it. This is how we do what we do. This is an investigative tool, uh, the model here. But then we also look at another uh, model that was developed, the spheres of influence. And, uh, research, education, outreach, practical application, all based on um, indigenous wisdom. And so we talk about that as what we do. So once we identify the issues and um, we frame it out with the theoretical model, we, we start thinking of, well, how do we investigate or um, educate or bring to light the issue that we've identified? And so <clears throat> both of these models together they talk about um, how do we operate as an indigenous institution within our community. And this is sort of a, a photo collection of showing both our work within the community, visitors that come to our community, our students going out visiting, and some of the partnerships that we work with um, through, our, through our institute and the relationships that we've established. Um, as Tony said, the, uh, the CASC, Northeast Climate Adaptation Science Center, has been a big one for the last seven years. And it's, it's helped us um, develop a lot of capacity in terms of how we connect 
with tribes on climate change, but also work with the climate scientists looking to develop tools to assist with that, with those efforts. Um, so this is our campus. Uh, this is the southern, southern border of the reservation. It's in the town of Kashina. That's the main campus. Uh, this is the SDI office. And so if I were to walk from here to the culture building on the other side, it would take me about five, six minutes. So it's not a very big campus. Um, but one thing we do have, or a couple things we do have, are these um, close connections to both uh, agricultural area and forested areas. And so what we've been trying to do, what the Institute's been trying to do is work with the college to develop outdoor learning areas, um, long-term research sites in both the demo forest and the, the agricultural area as a way to connect classroom education with the research that we're doing to make it more relevant to our students. And so the different areas we focus in are the climate impacts on the forest, the um, indigenous planning, so re revitalizing the way that tribes had planned and um, using that as a way for them to think about planning again from that indigenous perspective, the sustainable agriculture work. Um, and then this is just kind of a general one, campus and community sustainability. So it, it's just thinking through how do we as a campus serve as um, a pilot site for testing ideas that might be ramped up in the community like renewable energy projects like our Oh, this satellite photo doesn't have our biomass unit, but um, looking at biomass, solar, um, wind power. Um, <clears throat> so it, it's, it's a lot of opportunity there. And this is a, a unique role that tribal colleges play because the campuses are often situated in the tribal community like, like um, CMN. Um, and so some of the work we do is connecting our, our faculty, students, and community partners in learning together, what we call a professional learning community. And these are some of the, like I said, the place-based projects. This is behind the SDI office right here, just working on our turtle garden as a way to talk about sustainable agriculture. And so if I were to give an example, this is early on, uh, few years ago when we were talking about sustainable agriculture and since then it's led to what I talked about being able to hire a faculty member to now have them start developing a degree program to help have them help um, redesign our research framework to connect with that degree program. Uh, the other big part of the Institute, the things that we do and this is, I think, one of the most important is we connect our students through internships. And the way I approach things, um, <clears throat> I'm a, a firm believer in making sure everybody understands they're a part of a team so that they're not just bringing their content knowledge, but they're also developing as a professional so that they don't go out into the whatever job or um, advancing their academic career without understanding the responsibility they have in terms of um, sharing the information, but also conducting themselves in an appropriate manner, um, facilitating these relationships that, that are important. Um, so every grant project, any project we can think of, we're always writing in internship positions. During the summer, we have anywhere between 13 to 21 internship positions that we start out on campus. They all start one week together and then they disperse to their separate projects and check in midsummer. and then at the end of the summer, they are required to do a um, presentation to the community. And I was talking earlier with the, the organizers that public speaking is not my favorite thing in the world, but I seem to have a job where that's all I do. And so in that regard, I really, I tell the students, I give them my story and tell them I'm just sharing the pain and you'll thank me in the future. So 
Um, so that's a big part is in through that effort, creating professionals, but also they have a network of peers now that they've gone through this summer experience. They're CMN students, they are Menominee students that are at other institutions that come home for the summer. They are different tribal members. They are graduate students um, that we just throw into the group. We had, um, we had German students, um, forestry students visiting with the Forest Service and we told them come over. And so it, it's a lot of network and perspective expansion is what I think it really does for our students. Um, <clears throat> and this is our, our recruiting, what I view as our recruiting class. So the Sustainability Leadership Cohort is um, a high school program. This past summer we had 2021. 20, our, our grant said 20, but we had a waiting list um, up to five extra students. And we just kind of pooled money together and said, oh, we're, you know, we have big hearts. We can't tell anybody no. So we just brought them on board. And um, no, uh, this, this is an opportunity to engage our area youth in thinking about sustainability concepts. But I also think it lends to um, building up their interest in the CMN campus. Even though it's in the community, a lot of times, People aren't sure what to make of the college. They're not sure how to approach it. And so I think with the SLC, we do a lot of um, community outreach just through them coming to the, the campus to participate in the summer and them going out in the community and doing their, their work. So this is a representation of thinking through our mission, working within our community, but also thinking more broadly and how do we scale that up and work. Um, our primary focus is helping our community, working there to address issues that we're, we're finding, but also the other part of it is sharing beyond that. So scaling up to regional, national, um, international work. And so applying the model across to develop a global perspective. And a, a lot of different projects, we've taken on a lot of different projects, um, but because the, the poster said tribal resilience and climate change, I, I figured I'd focus on um, one of the specific projects. So we've, we've uh, for the past, I would say five years, um, through the, the work with the Northeast CASC, have worked on developing this website, the Northeast Indigenous Climate Resilience Network. And so really it's a way to, to build um, on the projects that we've worked on as examples for other tribal colleges in the region, for other tribes across the region. <clears throat> but it's also a chance to, to think beyond just um, certain designations like federally recognized tribes. So for folks that aren't familiar, um, there are federally recognized tribes, there are state recognized tribes, and there are unrecognized tribes. And the majority out here are state and unrecognized with just a few that have land holding. So you can see the kind of the difference in the scale of the lands, the tribal lands that um, indigenous peoples currently reside on to the kind of the larger um, reservation lands in the Midwest and they become larger towards the West. But one of the things that we work on is understanding these different contexts and how do we work with tribes that are trying to address uh, climate issues within their community when they don't have a land base or when they're, you know, all their resource and effort is focused on language revitalization, um, restoring lands, access to lands are gaining their lands back, revitalizing their cultures. You know, how do we work with tribes that are strapped for resources or have no resources? and are dealing with those issues along with now with climate change. Um, so that's kind of the broad regional 
perspective of creating this collaboration of tribes, climate scientists, um, and other partners and allies to not only work with federally, but also state and unrecognized, making opportunities available as we can. Um, but one of the things that has come out of that partnership is this new um, document or this new effort by a team led by um, the Great Lakes Indian Fish and Wildlife Commission. So this, uh, this adaptation menu, Deba Gin Jagadig Anishinaabe Ezetwad. So I'm still working on my Ojibwe. And, uh, but as a team, we came together. And one of the things that, that um, I thought was cool about what Glyphwick and the other tribal partners were talking about at the time was they attended a training that the Forest Service put on, um, Northern Institute for Applied Climate Science. And it had these menus for choosing strategies or approaches on how to work, uh, develop climate adaptation efforts in their communities. And so they went and they said, um, well, that's great, but we wouldn't have done it that way. Or what about this? What about non human beings, what about um, uh, bringing tobacco and offering it to your elders to ask for guidance, things like that. And so eventually it developed into this group of collaborators from different entities, NIACS, Glyphwick, 1854 Minnesota Treaty Authority, um, Intertribal Council of Michigan, our institute, and working through how we would approach climate planning from an indigenous perspective. And this was just, um, I think, our way of addressing an issue we had identified across the group. But we also wrote it in a way using some, uh, using Ojibwe language and Menominee language as examples so that other tribes, as they think about approaching climate change, could look at it and just bring their own language into the, the concepts or the strategies and make it more relevant. So. It's still a work in progress. It, this was a two-year development. Actually, yesterday, the team was in Minnesota accepting a Climate Adaptation Leadership Award for, for this document. So um, I was really happy to see that, to see them there. And especially, we have a crew that ranged across these, um, these institutions, but also there's uh, been a little one that's been a part of the group, the mom and dad are um, part of the team. And so she's made uh, a few of the workshops that we've done. She's, she was there for the award. And so really, I think that right there is an example of indigenous planning is not um, separating out certain people from the community. And so, and that, that's all. Um, I want to thank again Tony and Lubin and the Barack Lecture sh Series for inviting me, and thank you for your attention. So. We, have, we have time for some questions, and actually we're going to have to circulate a mic for those questions because they want those to be recorded. So hopefully it doesn't stifle you from asking a question, but just bear with our logistics here. There will also be a public reception right after this outside for folks to get a chance to talk with Chris out there, too. So. Thanks so much, Chris. I wanted if you, I wonder if you could go back a slide. Oh, yep. And, um, you know, there's this sort of sense of having real actions to take, but I also think, I wondered if you might comment a little on the symbolism associated with the, <clears throat> the um, imagery yeah. up there. Yeah, so this, um, this was created by one of the team members, Katie. Um, and what she was signifying were, <clears throat> is actually related to the, the project title. Um, so indigenous, or my presentation title, Indigenous Sustainability Paying Deference to Our Future Relatives. And when I was thinking of that title, um, I was kind of playing around with these experiences and I thought about this as well, that um, the way she drew uh, 
the turtle as a representation of uh, Turtle Island or that relationship with the land, but then also the connection between the different, the non-human beings. So the ones that don't have a voice in some of the decisions we make today as humans. And we, there was a lot of debate. I wasn't at all of the meetings, but the ones I did go to and the ones I heard about, it didn't matter what part of the, the document we were focused on, but there, you know, it, there was a lot of discussion and back and forth on single words, phrases, concepts. Use of the term species was actually what started the discussion on beings. So not only the, the non-human, but the, um, the spirits, the, um, that connection with the, the forest and the, the people in the community. And so this was just, um, as I understood it, Katie's way of trying to represent those two years of discussion and development on this project. And, and even this, we, we kind of haggled back and forth in emails and on the phone. And I think this really was, uh, came out as a good project, um, a, good, a good feeling, I guess, you know, a good um, result. You could just feel the, and it wasn't like we wrote grants or anything. It was the way I viewed it, like minds coming together. And as we started agreeing on what we were trying to do, we just start bringing time and resources and people together to accomplish what we had agreed to do. So um, I think that's a perfect representation of that effort. Other questions? Thank you for your talk. And one of your six pillars includes human perception, which strikes me as really important, but can coincide or cannot coincide with what we might call data or fact sometimes. So can you just talk about that piece of it, human perception? Yeah, um, <clears throat> and I think this, so one of the things, the model was developed and it's been in place for over 20 years. In my mind, I think some of the emergence of the work by different indigenous scholars in looking at um, ontology, epistemology, um, methodology, I think that the richness of that work is something that is definitely helpful here. Um, it can start describing, you know, different ways of knowing indigenous knowledge. Um, Date, uh, science, uh, Western science, um, different approaches and perspectives to understanding reality and how that's applied, how that's integrated, or how we, how we bring it together to address these common issues like global climate change. It's a, definitely a natural phenomenon that's impacting all of us in different ways. So. That's cur currently how I'm starting to view it. Originally, as it was developed, um, I think it sort of had that context, um, but it was more based on um, thinking in terms of the way Menominee in the past thought, how we think today as we've gone through colonization and how we're, um, how we're starting to think as we prepare for the future. So there's a lot of, um, different ways to view it, but I think the other important part is a lot of times our espoused values differ greatly from our actions. And so that uh, theory action gap, I think is a very important part of the, the model that we've only just start touching on and thinking about, um, but yeah. Does anybody else have a question that they'd like to ask to the group? Yeah. Thank you. Welcome. I have a question that maybe follows exactly on what you were just saying and the, the previous question, and you mentioned the, the theory action gap or value action gap. And something you mentioned also in your talk was this idea of 
Well, at one point you said you can see the values on the landscape in the satellite image, and then you also talked about wanting to address that, the impact of values on the landscape in your PhD program, and I'd just love to hear more about what you mean by that, and, and also how it relates to that last comment that you made just now. You mean I can't just make statements in the... <laughs> oh, darn. Um, <clears throat> well, I, I really do think that, um, and it's two different, I see two different approach or two different contexts. So within my own community, um, and this is something I, I've been thinking about and I talked with my wife about too, about thinking of our generation and um, colonization and where we were at. Like I grew up a lot with uh, Bugs Bunny and watching TV and that was sometimes my babysitter for the mere fact that my mom and dad were both working. Um, and so, but I also grew up attending Catholic church, um, attending sweat lodge every now and then and understanding there was a difference not necessarily knowing they were separate because I remember in grade school um, uh, in the back of the church we had a, one of our old the older boys teaching us traditional dance for a procession we were going to do into church and so that that kind of experience and then as I grew up and start thinking about um, or grew up yeah I'm growing up but um, as I start thinking more about these things, it, it's just the, the mix of perspectives within the community, but then thinking about mainstream society and the perspectives that are there. And so I'm trying to think about that context, the external context, and how do those differ? How do people perceive these forest management um, forest management strategies, why do they perceive them differently? And um, eventually, you know, who's, who's right, who's wrong, or is there a right and wrong? And I think that's why I point to the satellite photo in terms of if we want a forest that lasts, that is maintained, and that continues to sustain a people, I look at that satellite photo as a representation of that. And, and the other part that kind of struck me more recently was I, I kept saying, because we want to plan for our future generations, but in a way, cutting the timber, creating farms was the settler's way of thinking for their future, I assume, thinking they were building a life for future generations. And so, I'm starting to evolve more from just saying, oh, this is good, this is bad, to look at how these human values impact and shape the landscape. So I, yeah, pushing, pushing me a little further than I was thinking, but that's the whole purpose of this. Chris, and, and I want to go back to the to the satellite picture, and I wonder a little bit of a forestry question. What was done in that tornado damaged area? Was there any salvage logging done? What was based on the values that we just talked about? How was that treated? Um, <clears throat> that's a whole other story too. That's that's a difference in values in terms of the tribe managed this area, and this is national forest, and so. I remember at the beginning, right away, there were meetings. Um, in my role, it, I was a compliance enforcement officer, so I translated information to the tribal governing body, but also sat with uh, MTE, the forestry folks, to make sure I was translating correct information. But their interest was assessing the damage and then figuring out how to salvage it before um, infestations like uh, diseases or um, insect outbreaks could develop in these areas and potentially spread into the unaffected forest areas. And so Menominee Tribal Enterprises started on that endeavor. 
And I think within two years of the blowdown, the initial blowdown, they had salvaged the entire area, or as much as was possible. Some areas they just left because of accessibility or there were water um, areas they wanted to protect. Um, the National Forest, from what I understood, was still going through their environmental assessment at the time. I don't think they had, other than maybe emergency, cutting out roads, um, there were homes that were um, impacted. So other than emergency sal um, salvage logging or cutting, they hadn't salvaged any of the timber off the forest. So I think that just shows, um, it shows the, the response um, the response time that tribes can deploy in terms of ensuring the health and protection of the forest. But it's also more, I think, an indicator of the kind of the, the change in values on national forests and that sometimes people often associate conservation to the exclusion of the communities benefiting from the forest to where it becomes detrimental. And, and I think that's an interesting one to include in this landscape where the, the forests were clear cut, farmland was created, heavy impact uh, human use to national forests that are um, bogged down by um, laws and uh, anytime you propose a timber harvest that I believe they get sued or they get held up in court. Um, from my understanding, I don't know if that's still the case, but um, I mean, that's a difference in sustainable management approaches right there, I think. Oh. So uh, we have, like I said before, a public reception outside for folks who want to stick around, but I, I hope everybody's really enjoyed us. It's always amazing to hear Chris talk about the Menominee people. Uh, those of us that are in forestry have always been external admirers of the work that happens there, and part of that admiration stems from the amazing people like Chris that represent their story. And so thank you, Chris, for taking the time to share that today with us. And those that want to talk with Chris a bit, they'll be outside for about a half hour or so um, as part of the reception. So thanks again, Chris, for being here. Thank you.